Hello everyone, my name is Liz Ijikevich, and today I'm going to be introducing a new system called Stratosphere, which is tailored towards finding vulnerable cloud storage buckets. Uh, and this is work with my collaborators and colleagues at Stanford University. So as we probably all know, the use of cloud storage is really widespread. We have major tech companies such as Amazon, Google, and Alibaba, all providing services uh, for people to store their data in these tech companies' clouds. And actually, cloud storage has become so popular recently that a recent blog post by Amazon revealed that their service, S3, now stores over 100 trillion objects in just their one cloud. And this equates to having 13,000 objects per person in the entire world, just in Amazon's single cloud. And so people have found many uses for cloud storage over the years. A uh, primary usage is to use it as a primary data or file storage, which is great because it gives users an elastic ability to grow and shrink their storage without having to allocate a predetermined amount of memory. Data backup is also a great way to use cloud storage. Cloud storage data centers are often somewhere else in the world, and so you don't need to worry about your primary data storage going on or offline, and that kind of impeding your ability to use your data that may be stored somewhere else. And actually, cloud storage has also evolved to be used to host web content. So in this example here, if you have a restaurant, uh, they may upload their menu to a cloud storage bucket, in this case with the address mymenu.s3.amazonaws.com, and so the expectation is, is that if a customer wants to use their menu and find it online, then they just go to this cloud storage bucket address and the menu will be there. And so configurations of cloud storage buckets make all of these use cases pretty achievable. Uh, in the menu case, you would hope that the restaurant makes their bucket public such that any user can read the data. And in the primary data and file storage case or the data backup case, most likely companies will make it private as they don't want anyone to read their proprietary data. And so, as you can see, cloud storage services are easy and convenient to use. But unfortunately, misconfigured cloud storage buckets are actually a major security problem. Uh, we find that there are industry sectors all over that have actually become victim to misconfigured cloud storage buckets. For example, there's a healthcare vendor provider that accidentally revealed the social security numbers and medical history information of their patients due to cloud storage. We found that a Florida County database accidentally revealed the logins of government officials. And we also found that this huge vendor that works with half of the Fortune 100 companies accidentally exposed a terabyte of backups. And the thing that all of this has in common is that the private buckets should have been private and they were misconfigured to be public. And beyond even revealing private data, we find that cloud storage buckets have also introduced web vulnerabilities and vulnerabilities in JavaScript. And this has affected nearly everyone. Nearly 80% of companies have experienced a cloud data breach of some form. So, one thing is clear with all of the state of the world is that researchers are struggling to improve the security posture of cloud storage buckets in the wild. And the reason for this, as we will show in this work, is because researchers are actually struggling to see into the cloud storage ecosystem. And without actually seeing into the ecosystem, it's not possible to understand the ecosystem and therefore improve its security. So in this work, we're going to answer three primary questions. First, do existing cloud scanning algorithms find the majority of cloud storage buckets? Second, building off of what we find, we're going to introduce a new system to show how to most efficiently find cloud storage buckets. And third, we're going to present one of the largest cloud storage ecosystem studies to date and explain the security posture of cloud storage buckets and begin to understand why so many remain vulnerable. Okay, so to study the cloud storage ecosystem, we must find buckets. And to find buckets, you must guess valid bucket names. And so the search space to find valid bucket names is actually quite enormous. So a bucket name address can be anywhere from three to 63 characters, numbers, or symbols long. So that equates to roughly 10 to the 99 possible names per cloud provider. <laughs> 
And so, as some of you are aware, there's this uh, challenge to search the space of IPv6 addresses in internet measurement. That's considered an unsolved problem. And this search space is orders of magnitude larger than searching the IPv6 address space. So what do state-of-the-art bucking scanning algorithms do today? Well, we find there are two categories. One are target generators. So a target generator scanning bucket algorithm attempts to guess relevant valid bucket names using template patterns in word lists. So for example, if you wanna guess all the buckets that may belong to the company Tesla, you'll input the word Tesla and the algorithm will have a preset template where it takes your inputted word and it concatenates it with different likely words that appear in a bucket name such as data or backup. And then it'll output a deterministic list of these names such as Tesla underscore data, data underscore Tesla. And so while these algorithms actually do a good job of finding targeted buckets, they don't do a good job of finding all the buckets in the cloud storage ecosystem. And so as a result, we have this other category of scanners that we refer to as global scanners. And so global scanners try to guess all valid bucket names. So not just bucket names that, for example, apply to Tesla. And so the most state of the art scanner that we find is by prior work by Continella et al. And so they have two sub algorithms in which they attempt to guess all the valid bucket names. So one algorithm generates three to four character bucket names at random. And the second algorithm takes an inputted list of words, such as dictionary words or technology words, and it randomly concatenates these words and mutates them by like adding and uh, deleting a letter. And so this is the state of the art today. And so our first question is, well, okay, great. Do current scanning methods find the majority of real world buckets in the ecosystem? And so to answer that question, we actually need some kind of ground truth to compare between what buckets we expect to be in the ecosystem and which buckets these active scanning methods can find. And so the way we compile a ground truth is we look at passive data sources. Specifically, we look at the web, passive DNS, and external cloud storage indexing tools. And we look for buckets in three particular cloud providers, Amazon, Alibaba, and Google, which are some of the three major players in this space. And so what we do is we look at the domains present in these passive data sources, and we find which ones are attributed to the cloud storage addresses, for example, s3.amazonaws.com. And in passive D DNS, actually, we find hundreds of thousands of buckets there. And it's easy to find bucket names because DNS queries are often made in clear text, so you can just see which query they're, which domain they're querying for, and then we extract that as a potential bucket. name. And we validate out of all the buckets that we extract, which ones actually point to a real bucket. And so in order to compare again, which buckets active scanning methods find and which ones are in the ground truth, we need to have a metric that we can compare with. And so in this work, we quantify the guessability of real world bucket names as the metric to compare buckets with each other. And so we use an existing password checking metric actually, which approximates the guessability and it's a tool by ZXCVBN, a password checker. And so the way that they compute guessability is they incorporate the length of the word, the entropy of the word, but crucially also whether the inputted word contains existing words from corpuses. And so, for example, if you look at the name YouTube dash bucket, it may seem high in entropy and quite long, but in reality, we, intuitively, it seems easy to guess, right? Because it's just YouTube dash bucket. And so this metric actually can tokenize the input word and match which parts of the word uh, appear as domains or as dictionary words and which parts of the word seem random. And then from there, it compiles one particular quantitative guessability metric. So our first experiment, what we do is we take existing real world data sources and we on the X axis plot the logarithm of the guessability of the distribution of the words that each of the, the sources find. And we compare that with the distribution of the words the guessability of the words that current methods are able to find, in this case, the Continella scanner, and also if we were to just randomly generate uh, word or bucket names between three to 63 characters long. And we can immediately see that current scanning methods do not find the complexity of real world buckets. So the buckets that we find in our ground truth data sources are orders of magnitude more complex in guessability than the buckets that active scanning methods are searching for today. And the implication of this actually we find is that current scanners are less likely to find vulnerable buckets as a result. 
So we detail the methodology in our paper of how we define what something is vulnerable, but broadly, we define something as vulnerable if it has publicly accessible sensitive content or a configuration that allows anyone in this room or anywhere in the world to write, delete the bucket or pub publicly modify the setting of the bucket such that anyone could write or delete to the bucket. And so we again plot the distribution of the guessability of the names found buckets that we identify as vulnerable and compare it to the distribution of the names found by the Contenello scanner. And we see that again, vulnerable buckets are actually more likely to have more complex names than the buckets that active scanning methods are able to find. Okay, great. So clearly active scanning methods aren't that great, but how do we actually efficiently find real world buckets? Um, and to answer that question, we need to ask, well, how are cloud storage buckets named in the real world? Is it even possible to find these complex buckets or are they just complete random alphanumeric strings and in reality are impossible? So we find that 28% of all bucket names actually do appear completely random. So we use the ZXCVBN metric that we introduced before, which is able to extract from a string the random components and components of the word that seem to um, belong to a dictionary or corpus, and we find that ZXCBN for 28% of bucket names finds that the entire string contains no instance of any corpus word, technology word, or domain. And we also find that these random bucket names are actually quite long, so they're not your three to four character small bucket strings, it's actually length 18 and 25. And so as a result, these bucket names are probably not that easily guessable. But we do find that the rest of the cloud buckets actually share common name structure that make them predictable. So we find that the most common structure across 12% of buckets is some random alphanumeric symbolic combination concatenated with the word found in one of our corpuses. So for example, 3.8% of these buckets are something random concatenated with the word test. And so overall, we find that the top five naming patterns account for 60% of the buckets we have in our ground truth sources, and 60% of the bucket names contain at least one dictionary word. So doing this analysis with bucket naming structure, our group comes up with this insight that actually the structures of bucket names seem quite similar to passwords. They're both human generated. They're both language based. They both often contain random and non random components. And coincidentally, they're actually both used to access or protect one's data. And so we discovered that language models from prior work used to predict passwords can actually predict real world bucket names that are higher in complexity to guess. So concretely, we take three password language models that have been used to predict passwords and we apply them to predict bucket names. First, we use the probabilistic context-free grammar and was used to guess commonly used password in prior work. And what this model does is it uses existing patterns of tokens, so parts of a name, to predict new combination of tokens with similar patterns. We also use the n-grams Markov model, which uses the preceding n tokens, so the location of these tokens, to predict the next n tokens. And we also use a more sophisticated model of the three, and it's a recurrent neural net, particular, we use the long short term memory model. And this neural net is actually able to find hidden patterns within a string to predict new similar sequences of elements and new strings, which we will use to predict bucket names. And so in all three cases, this is existing work that has used these to predict passwords successfully. And so with these three language models, we introduce a new system for finding real world world buckets named stratosphere, which you can use to look down into the clouds. So Stratosphere is a pipeline that is composed of three primary steps. The first step is extraction. So what it does is it takes these ground truth data sources, passive DNS, web, and it finds automatically all of these bucket names or names that seem to appear uh, to be a part of a bucket. Next, it validates these bucket names to actually check that indeed this DNS query is actually pointing to a real bucket name. And then what it does is it takes these valid bucket names and it puts them into these models and it starts training the models with the valid bucket names. Then the models output some candidate bucket names. Stratosphere revalidates that these new bucket names are actually real buckets, then uses them to train the models again and continues the cycle infinitely, therefore finding new buckets. 
And so the first insight we find with stratosphere is that language models actually do continuously find new buckets. So here we're showing the five variations of the language models that I've described. And we find that each of them, we, we run them for one and a half months, and we ask them to predict 10,000 new bucket names at every iteration step. And we find that over the one and a half months, the buckets are continuously finding roughly 2% of the bucket names that they predict, they're actually correct and they point to real buckets. And we find that actually out of all the models, the recurrent neural net, so the LSTM model, learns over time and its hit rate gets better slightly and it continuously finds and predicts new buckets. And they do much better at their hit rate than the prior state of the art Continella. Thankfully, Stratosphere finds more complex and real world buckets. So again, if we look at all of the language models that Stratosphere uses, we find that the token PCFG model actually finds the names with the hardest to guess, with the hardest guess abilities, and finds names orders of magnitude more complex than the state of the art Continella Global Scanner. Now, we also see in this figure that, well, passive DNS sources and they still seem to have more complex names than even Stratosphere is able to find. And we find that actually Stratosphere approaches the theoretical limit of guessability. And so the way we find that is we use the same ZXDBBN metric from before, which can identify the random components within a bucket name. And we remove the, anything that's identified as random from the bucket name, and we recompute the guessability of the buckets. And we find that as the guessability becomes more complex on the X axis, our models find roughly the same number of buckets as these passive data sources do. And this is in contrast with the prior work such as Continental in which the number of buckets that they find drastically decreases as the complexity gets tougher. And so, okay. So you might think, okay, well, passive data sources are still finding more complex buckets, so why would we even use active scanning methods in the first place? And the answer is because active scanning methods find drastically more buckets than passive data sources. So though we find hundreds of thousands of buckets in, for example, these passive DNS sources, the collection time for that source we find is roughly six to 10 years long. Where, uh, and that equates to roughly discovering, for example, in Farsight, the primary passive DNS source, to discovering roughly 300 new buckets per day. Whereas if you take all of the active scanners, they're finding roughly thousands of buckets per day that are valid. Okay, so now that we've found more buckets in their stratosphere, uh, we start investigating the security posture of all the 2.1 million buckets that we find in this work. And so first we find that roughly 18% of Amazon buckets that allow us to read their configuration are misconfigured. So 13% of them that are allow us, that are public buckets, allow us to write objects to them. And this means that an attacker could write terabytes of objects to someone's bucket without them knowing, and then they would have to go and pay Amazon for that storage. We also find that 5% of private buckets, so they're originally configured to be private, but they actually allow anyone to change the permission of the bucket. So that means that an attacker can come in and change the private bucket to be public. Across the three clouds that we study, uh, Amazon buckets are more likely to be misconfigured. So we find that in terms of private buckets, Google Cloud and Alibaba, near 0% of their buckets allow someone to write or change permissions or delete these buckets. But for Amazon, it's roughly 5%. And we hypothesize that this is because of Amazon's complex configuration permissions. So Amazon allows a customer roughly 100 different possibilities of how to configure their bucket, whereas Google and Alibaba on average only give roughly three or 10 permissions. So it's much more restrictive and it seems to equate to there being uh, less misconfigurations. We also find that misconfigured buckets, our new buckets continue to be misconfigured. So this is not just old buckets from before that are sitting around. So by taking the first updated or last updated timestamp of a bucket and plotting it over time, we find that the fraction of vulnerable permissions on Amazon's cloud in particular increases over time. And we don't see this trend in Google Cloud, interestingly. We do see an interesting dip, roughly 2017, in the Amazon, the fraction of uh, cloud buckets that seem to be vulnerable in the Amazon cloud. And this seems to coincide with the introduction of a tool called Macy, which Amazon deployed in order for 
people to see if they identify and see if they have vulnerable data in their clouds. And it seemed to maybe have worked for a bit, but then the fraction of vulnerability goes up. So you may think, well, great, people have misconfigured buckets, but is this a real threat? And the answer is yes. So we deployed a couple of cloud storage honeypots in which we named them with different names, as you see on the Y axis. And we made them public and writable, and we deployed them for four months and just to see what happened. And within the first 24 hours, scanning, unsolicited scans start appearing in our bucket logs. And so we find that Amazon receives four times the amount of unsolicited traffic compared to the Google Cloud or Alibaba. And we find that buckets with simpler names, such as WVGY at the bottom, receive more scanning traffic, which makes sense because the bucket name is easier to guess. And interestingly, we don't actually experience any scanner trying to upload or write to our buckets, but they do enumerate the permissions of the buckets, perhaps storing this information for a later use. So throughout this entire experiment, we find that notifying users of misconfigured buckets remains a challenge. So we deploy these honeypots, which are clearly misconfigured and vulnerable, and Amazon, out of all three clouds, is the only cloud to contact us to warn us, and it takes them four months to actually email us to tell us, hey, maybe your bucket is misconfigured. And this experience kind of encapsulates everything that we see with notifications. We find no cloud provided way to report misconfigured buckets to find the owners of the buckets we find a lot of misconfigured buckets but we it's tough to see what to actually do with them and who to report them to. We do find something funny which in 3% of the public buckets that we find they contain a white hat warning message, so this is someone completely random uploading data to someone else's random public bucket and they upload it as a warning saying in the, the message says warning you know your bucket is public i'm writing into your bucket and 46 percent of these buckets with this message the owners do not notice that someone has uploaded something in their bucket they're continuing to upload files and they never change the permission of this buckets so in summary with this work i hope you've come out with a couple of takeaways one, existing cloud storage scanners are less likely to find real world and vulnerable buckets. And we demonstrate that language models, existing language models can be used to identify real world buckets with more complex names. And with that, we've introduced Stratosphere, which is an open source system that finds real world buckets. And since bucket misconfigurations still remain widespread, we hope that Stratosphere is a system that will be used by researchers to help secure this ecosystem. If you have any questions, please feel free to email me or ask me now. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So that's a very interesting uh, work. I'm, I would like to ask you one question before asking the, the audience to go with their questions. That is, um, have, you, uh, have you explored a bit more the landscape of possible attacks on the buckets that you have found? For example, the type of attack will depend on the resources that are uploaded on that system, uh, on those buckets. So did you, did you check, for example, the uh, type of files and how those files may be used? Wow. Yeah, so we, we focused on the configuration of buckets primarily in this work. Hello. Um, and, and we do know of their malicious files being uploaded and a new phenomenon now has actually been people encrypting the contents of public buckets and then ransoming them off and demanding Bitcoin. Um, but no, in this work, we, we just focused on the config of finding buckets and looking at their configurations. I mean, and it's definitely future work to kind of, again, now that we can find a lot more buckets to actually start understanding their contents a bit more with the caveat of the ethical implications that that might actually hold but separate conversation yeah that makes sense yeah. thanks <laughs> uh, so is there any question from the audience both in person and remote otherwise i will go with another question okay I yeah, see we have a question question. here yes great thank you it was a very nice presentation um so what do we do about it so like at the moment like yeah, yeah, yeah. right i mean this is so, like a very big problem, right? Like we see that it's a big problem. What can we do about it now? So, so how do we find those people or like who owns them? Right, so there's kind of two communities of, of, that we're trying to target here. One is if you're the user of a bucket, like 
please make it private, <laughs> right? That's the simplest thing that we can do. Now, as security researchers, I think we do need to understand the space more. Um, and we need to have a bigger conversation with cloud providing companies. I think they're the, the best tools here. They can see which buckets are public. Uh, they really need to step up their game in working with us to help secure this. And so I think that's the, the, I mean, the problem is maybe they're not interested, right? So, so that's the problem. It seems like the users are, do not know how to use the you know, configuration. And it seems like actually they don't care. Yeah. No. So maybe we have to just make a lot of like, I don't know, news, not just in raid and. Um, I definitely, right? they, at some point they do care when they get bad publicity, right? But they just haven't received enough bad publicity yet. But yeah, I agree that I think it's, it's, you know, hopefully at some point they're going to step up because they, at the end of the day, cloud providers generally are, are the best people to take care of their own problems. But yeah, it's going to take a push from the security community to then convince them to, to help step up. And if that's more work in this space or whatever that remains to be seen. But, yeah. If I may, I have another question while yeah. looking for guests. So in the point, you showed the, the, the number of buckets you found divided by provider. I was wondering if those numbers were absolute. It, it, it results that the AWS has the largest fraction of misconfigured packets. So I was wondering if this is because of the result of AWS being maybe the leader in the market, if we can say that, or just or so, whether the numbers that you show were normalized by market share. So I mean, they're normalized by the amount of buckets that we found. And so it's the fraction of the buckets that we found that Amazon seems to have um, more vulnerabilities. So now there, there exists a bias in that maybe Alibaba and Google Cloud buckets are just so much harder to find than Amazon buckets. And therefore, you know, we and they're more vulnerable and we didn't find them. So that bias may exist, but it's it's normalized. It's the fraction of buckets that we found, but we didn't. You know, Amazon is the number one in terms of market yep. share, so that could impact. Thanks. It. Yeah. Question. I see Mark has a question. Yeah. Just, just so two quick questions. So the Alibaba, your your bucket name generator, was he tailored to take Chinese language into account, or was it English based? So it's whatever the whatever buckets appeared in our ground truth. That is what we use to train to find buckets across all three clouds. Um, we experimented with tailoring the models towards finding only vulnerable buckets and only buckets in particular cloud providers. So it's not explicitly filtering for Chinese, but we did kind of um, filter our input data set to see if the models could start getting better at guessing a particular target set. And we found that actually they do worse with the smaller input set. So they found in general more buckets in, on Alibaba when you train them across all three cloud providers. Uh, they find more vulnerable buckets when you train them on both vulnerable and not vulnerable buckets. So, so we didn't explicitly filter for Chinese, but I think this result of kind of shrinking the input training data set to see if it finds more of a particular target set that fell through for us. Uh, and for the the scanners that you have observed, have you checked if they're, I mean, you, you make the assumption that there are attackers looking for for that, but it can also be good people like you, researchers looking for that. So have you done some analysis of the source IPs or stuff we like did. that? We did. We did an analysis of the source IP and we have, it's just, I believe, a figure or a paragraph in the paper that goes into that. and. You know, obviously we don't know who they are. We, we don't say that they are attackers, but I, I, what I do remember is an interesting finding was that the top countries that scan public buckets are quite different than the top countries that scan IPv4 addresses. So it's different countries, source IPs originating from different countries targeting this space and the IP address space. Okay. Thank you very much for our questions and the answer. Let's uh, thank once more our speaker. And, uh... <laughs>